information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Andy Duncan, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Today I'm speaking to Steve Baker, who's the Conservative MP for Wickham in the House of Commons, best known for quotes on Hayek and Mises and his belief in sound money. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Andy. For the last 40 years, the British state has funded itself through taxation and borrowing. However, it now finds it hard to squeeze revenue out of these two methods. So in the last four years, since 2008, it's turned to a third leg, which is printing money to cover its spending deficit in something euphemistically known as quantitative easing. Steve, what do you think about quantitative easing? Well, the first thing is I wish that people would state uh, the situation quite as plainly as you've just done. I think that would clear away a lot of obfuscation and let people see what's really happening. But I think that QE is just the latest manifestation of the process that's been funding the welfare state since the end of Bretton Woods. The governor of the Bank of England was more or less explicit about it recently, although he didn't connect it to the welfare state. The money supply between 1997 and 2010 tripled, M4 tripled, from 700 billion to 2.2 trillion. And what that tells us is that the process of money creation, as listeners to this podcast will know, is it did not begin with quantitative easing. Quantitative easing just makes explicit a process that's been going on through credit expansion for for a long time, but specifically for those uh, on a chronic scale uh, since the end of Bretton Woods. So I'm concerned that the promises of politicians made over the last 40 years, a period where the British government's only been in surplus briefly and twice, those promises have been funded indirectly and in a very subtle and destructive way by debasing the currency. And that's why we're in the mess we're in today. Some would say that the debasement of money is the debasement of society. So if we look at the Roman Empire, and we start with Augustus with a pretty good silver money, and that silver money stayed quite good for a long time. And then once it started debasing quite heavily, the Roman Empire started debasing. Do you think the debasement of the British pound is going to lead to a debasement of British society? I think it has already led to a debasement of British society. When you look, and indeed European and American society, you look across Europe at the moment, you see people rioting. Yesterday there was the news of riots right across the usual suspect countries, and people don't really know what's going on. People aren't sure whether capitalism has failed. I'm certain capitalism hasn't failed. I'm certain it hasn't really been tried. But this is the problem. Money is such a profound institution that uh, pervades everything we do in society and in business that when money is unreliable, it does damage everyone everywhere. And um, I picked up this morning a quote from Ayn Rand where she says, whenever destroyers appear among men, they start by destroying money, for money is men's protection and the base of a moral existence. And I think that's the key of it to it. If if we live in a society based on the division of labour, the only way to make that society work is the market. One half, one side of every transaction is money. If money is chronically inflationary, then you do debase the entire social system based on the division of labour. And you do it in a way which very, very few people understand. And the result is that you discredit the entire social system. If we ever do try capitalism rather than mercantilism, then uh, I will be extremely surprised. But maybe one of your proposals might make that come about. Because one of the things you'd like to do is change the British law to make bank directors directly personally responsible for their bank's losses. How's that progressing through Parliament? That bill actually dropped with the end of the last session. That's how it works with private members' bills. It's extremely rare for a private member's bill to become law. And when they do, it's usually on a, on a subject or in a situation where the government really wants a measure to proceed. People talk things out and so on. But my private members' bills and Douglas Carswell's were all introduced to try and move the conversation forward. And in a considerable degree, they have done. Um, people have watched what we've done to an extent I, I had not previously realised. People have uh, I've never met have approached me and discussed with me what we've been doing to change the conversation. So it, it won't go anywhere, but what it has done is made a contribution to the conversation. And what happened to the other arm of that, which was to make banks published accounts much easier for other people to interpret? The other bill was about flaws in the international financial reporting standards to do with uh, loan loss provisioning and mark to market. What's happened is a classic problem of extreme rationalists trying to construct 
one global standard that meets everybody's needs. And of course, they failed by making errors. And what I tried to do was introduce a bill which would require banks to produce parallel accounts in UK GAAP to show their true prudent positions. And actually, that measure, that's making, in terms of shifting the conversation, that's making a lot more progress. Because if you look at the media, you can see Andy Haldane at the Bank of England has picked up this subject. I've got some emails to catch up with where it's been discussed in the House of Lords. And people are warming themselves up to the reality that IFRS is not appropriate for banks, that it's pro-cyclical, that it's overstating banks' capital, uh, overstating their profits. And it's possible, and I only say possible, that banks have ended up paying bonuses and dividends out of profits which have not actually been realised, and it's all become possible because of IFRS. So that measure, although my bill, again, dropped at the end of the session, the conversation does keep moving on that one. I think that's the measure that's most likely to come to fruition. I always think it's great to see you and Douglas and your friends in that little cabal in the House of Commons introducing these bills. And recently, Douglas Carswell introduced another one, which was to enable people to have complete ownership of their assets when they put them inside banks. Is this one progressing? Is this one pushing the conversation along too? It has pushed the conversation forward. People have started in Parliament, people who listen to Douglas have started realising that we don't own the money in our bank accounts. But the reality is the vast majority of members of Parliament we, we can't all study everything. But the monetary order is a mystery, it seems, to a lot of economists who just take money and inflation for granted and never really study where money comes from or what the consequences of inflationary money are. So yeah, it has moved the conversation on by helping people to understand that we don't own the money in our current accounts. And it might be quite a good idea if we did, or at least if we had the choice whether we owned it or not. And if we chose to own it, then we should pay a storage fee. If we chose not to own it, then we ought to accept the personal risk that the bank wouldn't be able to repay. But as of course, as you know, at the moment, the risk of the bank not being able to repay is projected onto taxpayers. Another thing I like seeing about your small group of people in the House of Commons is that hopefully you'll all be around when Mark Faber's great monetary reset takes place, if it takes place, because then you might be able to help reset the British monetary system. Do you think such a reset is going to come about? And if it does, do you think we could see the reintroduction of sound money, perhaps based on gold or silver or something else? Well, I'm sorry to say I do think we're going to have a monetary reset. I think it's the situation's far more advanced in the Eurozone than it is in the UK. Let's not forget we blundered into the post Bretton Woods monetary order when Nixon closed the gold window. It wasn't like it was consciously designed. And then sort of really post hoc, everybody, all monetarists and Keynesians, have legitimised the system. That system seems then now to be in profound trouble. So I do think there's a good chance for monetary reset. It's an argument that I talk about often. I try to do it always grounded in literature and and evidence, but it's a very frightening prospect. Um, Let's not forget that millions of people have been made dependent on the state for their livelihood, whether through being pensioners or through direct employment. And if the state is funded by chronically inflationary money, then they are in trouble, obviously directly. But we all rely on this paper money, this troubled paper money system. So the the notion that the monetary order is perhaps in its terminal stages is a, a frightening prospect. And I'd really like to think that economists and politicians would get ahead of the game and reform money before there's a horrific collapse. But I'm, I'm not sure that's possible. Do you think when we come to the crunch, if we come to the crunch, that they'll step back from the brink and stop printing money and bring on a huge liquidation? Or do you think they'll just keep the printing presses rolling and take us into a hyperinflation? Oh, in my pocket, there's a hundred trillion Zimbabwe dollar note. And so I have to say, this is the hundred trillion dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> if there's, a, say, a bond strike and government can't instantly adjust its spending to meet its uh, reduced means, what will they do? Will they just, as an emergency and in the short term, use money creation? Or will they um, slash spending and, and, and persuade the public to take the pain? It seems to me that the general trajectory of events and historic evidence is that they'll print. And if they p- keep printing, there will come a stage where people lose faith in paper money. And then we will be off into a hyperinflationary collapse. But I suppose when I have this conversation with politicians and also with you know friends around the Cobden Centre, the, the disagreement is really about how sensible politicians and economists are likely to be when the crunch moment comes. So those with no faith in politicians think that politicians will persuade or order the central bankers to print and will have a hyperinflationary collapse. Those with slightly more faith in people to understand the profound consequences and risks 
look, they, they think that we'll take the pain of a bond strike, have a horrible adjustment uh, and move forward. It's very, very difficult for me to judge. Part of the problem is that all of the current mainstream political leaders have all been educated. If they've been educated in economics, they've been all been educated in the contemporary mainstream. So they're either monetarists or Keynesians or some blend. The result of which is they're quite comfortable to put in budget documents that monetary activism is a pillar of the government's policy. Well, of course, when they say monetary activism, they don't mean removing money from the economy. They mean adding money to the economy at an appropriate rate to very carefully stimulate it and manage our recovery. Difficult to know where it ends. I think it's interesting that people like Mervyn King will quote in public Hayek, and he's even seen the famous Keynes Hayek video. But there seems to be a train of different economies moving towards hyperinflation. There's the euro kind of in the lead carriage, followed possibly by us, then possibly by Japan, and then finally the, the last carriage will be the United States. So we must look at the European Euroland project as our kind of test litmus paper. The euro seems to be in a bit of a death spiral. We've seen these riots and everything in Greece and Portugal and Spain. Where do you see the EU going, the euro going and Britain's membership of the EU? Well, if I start with Britain's membership of the EU, I think now it's not inevitable that we leave, but there's going to be enormous pressure ultimately to leave. With Barroso saying that uh, we need a new treaty for a fully federal Europe, it's very difficult to see how the UK could be uh, part of that. The Foreign Secretary said specifically we need a new arrangement with the fresh consent of the British people. So I, it is very much my hope that we will have a referendum and that the British public will choose to leave because I think it's the wrong kind of government and it's not in Europe's interest. When you look, though, at the project in the Eurozone, politicians are determined to press forward and continue the project and integration across the continent. And what we have to ask ourselves why. And the reason is that they fear economic nationalism as a cause of, of war, and they think the European Union is the answer to it. Anyone who's read Mises' omnipotent government would agree that economic nationalism is a uh, profound cause of war. Question really is whether it's the only cause of war, because the truth is, if you keep forcing government on people without their consent, you risk civil war. There's always been problems of separatism across Europe, whether it's been Basques or indeed in Ireland. Yeah, so it's worrying times in terms of the development, how it might go forward. I think where I'm encouraged is that the European peoples themselves, through trade and through long history, have ended up with far more bonds of friendship than will have existed 100 years ago. So I'd like to believe that the people of Europe will save themselves by rejecting rulers who are determined to force on them a government that isn't appropriate. There are projects in Germany and in Switzerland to reintroduce gold money, a gold Deutschmark project and a Swiss gold franc project. Do you think that we might have a, a British gold pound project starting soon? Well, when I was looking at what to do with my last private member's bill, I did consider introducing something to do just that. But I decided to go for the director's liability measures just to, you know, in terms of progressively moving the conversation on. Because the truth is, the longer we leave it at the moment, the more acceptable the conversation about gold becomes. So at the moment, if I can secure an opportunity to introduce another private member's bill, I think my next one will be a gold pound project. And how is the Cobden Centre helping you progress this conversation as well? Well, the, Com the Cobden Centre established itself in the London think tank world very, very quickly. Suddenly we arrived, we were talking about Austrian school ideas and the Manchester liberal tradition. It provides me with a really useful and deep uh, pool of intellectual support moral support as well as intellectual and academic. What I've been really surprised by is how many people from the practical world of banking have been interested in the Cobden Centre, getting some of us along to um, to speak at banks even. Um, I've been along myself on more than one occasion to talk to practical bankers about what's going on. So it, it, it's created a network that is flourishing which is supportive, which has started having friends in the media. You listen to Detlev Schlichter on uh, Start the Week on Radio 4, for example. He really set the tone of that conversation. So the Cobden Centre is, I think, a really important uh, resource. I would say that as its co-founder. You also seem to have penetrated organisations such as City AM and quite a lot of the kind of cognoscenti financial analysts in the London area. 
Yes, we do. I'm very proud that our network of senior fellows has uh, achieved that sort of reach. We, particularly on Radio 4, Jamie White has had an analysis, several analysis programs related to these issues. We've got um, Anthony Evans has been writing in City AM. And as we meet people and just keep discussing these ideas, more and more mainstream economists are prepared to say things like, it looks increasingly like there might be a monetary role for gold, which is something I heard from one well-known monetarist recently. On the record, for example, John Redwood and I were just debating, I intervened on him to make the case for competing currencies. And if I recall, his response was along the lines that I might be theoretically correct, but it wasn't practical politics. Well, this is a big move forward. If we can start persuading commentators, the media, practical politicians, that we need to do is have competition and choice in currencies, just as we need competition and choice in everything else, then we can really start moving this debate forwards and hopefully with intellectual arguments in time to head off you know, a horrible currency catastrophe. That sounds like uh, one of the ideas propagated by Ron Paul, who's just made his farewell speech to Congress. Now, some people have said that you're a bit of an English Ron Paul. What do you think of that comparison? Well, it's a very generous comparison. I don't think I'm anything like as famous as uh, Ron Paul. I think that's certainly true. I don't know that I agree with Ron Paul on everything he's ever said, I, 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 but I've, I've long admired much that he said. I mean, he's done a tremendous job of popularising Austrian school ideas and the cause of liberty. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm flattered to be compared, but I've got a long way to go yet before I've made the contribution to global politics that uh, that he has in the cause of liberty. But I think one of the most important things to remember is that he's, he's run for president in order to shift the conversation, not with a realistic chance of winning. Related to that, one of the important outcomes of the American presidential election was that uh, Gary Johnson only had about 1% of the vote. So in the land of the free, they re-elected Obama by a narrow margin and only about 1% of people went for Gary Johnson. So while I'm optimistic that our ideas, the ideas of the Austrian school and those of us who believe in the, the classical ideas of liberty, I'm optimistic that we're correct and that if those ideas were adopted widely, we would see prosperity, stability, human progress, an increase in civilization and con concern for our, for our neighbor. At the moment, it looks like the practical politics are still very statist. People do still want to believe this cruel fairy tale that government is the answer to every problem. And I think it is a cruel fairy tale. Um, our job is to move the conversation forwards and, and, and help people to understand that liberty is their best security, um, that their welfare would be best served by being a free people. But that's going to be a long old journey. And it's a journey that for the last hundred years we have not, uh, we have not really undertaken successfully. Well, I hope you can keep going with your small group in the House of Commons because when we have this great monetary reset, which I think is going to happen, I think you need to be there in order to put it through to take us towards sound money. So I'd like to thank you for your time today, Steve Baker. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos and iTunes podcasts from our gold research section.